Joan Kerr. Welcome to World Canvas from International Programs at the University of Iowa. We're coming to you from the Senate Chamber of the Old Capitol Museum, one of the Pentecost Museums on the Central Campus. Our production partners are UITV, the University of Iowa Pentecost Museums, KRUI 89.7, and Information Technology Services. This program is being recorded for statewide television and radio distribution over UITV, Iowa Public Radio, and KRUI. It will also be available along with all the programs in this series as a free podcast on iTunes. Tonight's topic is global science fiction in literature and in film, and we'll look at the genesis of science fiction and at its profusion around the globe, discussing recurrent themes and the impact of science fiction on both popular culture and everyday assumptions about the future. We'll also meet the artist behind Sleep Dealer, award-winning filmmaker Alex Rivera. So we have a good show ahead, and I think we might as well get started. In this first part of our program, we're going to get some historical perspective on the genre of science fiction, and then a sort of full immersion overview of the salient themes and the underlying assumptions, as well as the level of freedom science fiction allows the creator. So let me introduce our first guests. Uh, starting just to my left, we have Rob Latham, who teaches contemporary American and British literature cultural studies and science fiction at the University of California, Riverside. Some of you may know Rob from the years he taught here at the University of Iowa. He taught here for 13 years before going to California. He's the senior editor of the journal Science Fiction Studies and is a member of the editorial boards of the Journal of Science Fiction Film and Television and the Journal of the Fantastic in the Arts. He's also the co-editor of the Wesleyan Anthology of Science Fiction and is currently editing the Oxford Handbook of Science Fiction. So great to have you here, Rob. Thanks. Thanks. I'm happy to be back. Thanks. Brooks Landon is just next to Rob, and Brooks is a professor of English here at the University of Iowa and has taught courses in science fiction for many years. His last two books have explored the implications of science and technology in science fiction film and in science fiction literature. His classes focus on literary responses to technology or ways in which American culture has made technology usually constructed as progress, one of its central concerns. And I had the pleasure of watching a TV program that Brooks did many years ago. Someone sent it to me today called Watch the Sky, which was fantastic. You were great. So thanks, Brooks, for being here. Uh, and at the very end, we have David Wittenberg. Nice to have you, David. He's taught at the University of Iowa in the English Department and the Department of Cinema and Comparative Literature since 1998. Uh, he's the author, among other things, of Time Travel, The Popular Philosophy of Narrative, and his research and teaching interests include the 19th through 21st century literary theory and philosophy, American literature, architectural design and theory, and popular culture studies. His current research project is a book about the meaning of very large objects, tentatively entitled Big Culture Towards an Aesthetics of Magnitude. So thanks for being with us, David. Thank you. Um, when I was looking for a definition of science fiction, always a good place for me to start when I'm thinking about a, a program on a big topic like this, and I came across, the, across this quote by Rod Serling that I liked. Fantasy is the impossible made probable, and science fiction is the improbable made possible. Do you think that works? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think most critics do want to make some, some want to make hard and fast, others looser distinctions between fantasy and science fiction. Um, certainly when I teach, I teach a history of science fiction and then I teach a separate class history of fantasy and horror fiction. Um, but in terms of their origins as genres, they're completely bound up together. Um, and some scholars use broad terms like the fantastic to encompass the whole range of genres. Um, in terms of making the improbable possible, is that mm -hmm. it again? Mm -hmm. um, you know, science fiction right now is, is in a kind of race with the uh, technological change itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the things that you read about on the technology pages and, and blogs are, you know, science fiction is, is being outstripped by uh, the development of technology, but uh, I think that's as good a definition as I've heard. I mean, <laughs> scholars fight over definitions all the time. I'm, I'm reminded of um, Thomas Berger's definition of a novel as a uh, sequence of words and otherwise a lie. And <laughs> when we start talking about distinctions between fantasy and science fiction, let's remember we're, we're talking about a lie to begin with. That's the fiction part. And um, within the history of science fiction, the debate has been uh, over what's the best way to, to make the lie sound acceptable. Uh, 
and I've been working on a piece for, for Rob's Oxford uh, edition, uh, trying to deal with the, uh, uh, the difference between extrapolation and speculation in science fiction. Extrapolation sounds a little bit more scientific speculation, a little bit more toward that fantasy realm. And the one thing that I've figured out is that I can no longer distinguish between the two. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, David? Yeah, I think that you know this, this is a, an old and and persistent and almost obsessive problem in the field. Um, almost everybody seems to require a definition. When you're coming at at the field a little bit from the outside, as I am, maybe a little less than uh, more so than than Brooks and Rob, uh, it's quite striking how much energy is devoted. A, to, to finding a definition of science fiction per se, and then B, distinguishing it from fantasy. Um, and uh, in my little sub-corner of the field, time travel studies, uh, it, it's probably less important than in some other corners. Um, it's not clear, uh, and, and it's never been clear to either writers or critics that time travel is either one or the other, for instance. It's, it's crossed the, the line. Um, it, it, I think that the most interesting thing about this definitional problem is that almost every effort, and pro probably in fact every effort, to derive at either a definition or a distinction that would characterize science fiction has its own ideological and critical and scholarly and sometimes political commitments, and those are the most interesting things to try to work out. Why is it that uh, either critics or writers or readers or fans want to segregate or separate out certain portions of the field and not? Mm -hmm. So if you move past that part of it, the, the uh, discussion of how we exactly define it, tell us something about um, the pieces that are recognized as early pieces of science fiction. Take us back to what would be considered the earliest examples. Well, again, you're going to get a range of options depending on which historians you listen to. I mean, some of them trace science fiction back to the Epic of Gilgamesh and uh, Lucian of Samosata, ancient epics and, and early proto-novels of you know, thousands of years ago. I, I personally, I think that's nuts. Um, <laughs> hope they're not watching. Um, but uh, science fiction to me is a literature that emerges most, most pro plausibly in conjunction with the scientific revolutions of the 16th and 17th centuries, and especially with the major technological revolutions of the late uh, 18th and 19th centuries. I don't think you have science fiction until you have a culture that is broadly aware of science and its central role, not just philosophically, but in conjunction with technology and actually remaking the world that people live in. Mm -hmm. So they're oriented towards the future. They think that the future is going to be different, qualitatively, radically different from the world they live in. And I don't think you get the kind of critical mass for that until the early Vic Victorian period. Um, so some, I, I think you might be able to make an argument for Frankenstein. Mary mm -hmm. Shelley's Frankenstein is the first science fiction novel. Brian Aldiss, a British critic and writer, has made that argument. Um, I'm more likely to see Verne and then Wells as the progenitors, but I don't know if you have different and feelings. And if, if you want to play it safe in this, you don't talk about history. Uh, you either talk about a materialist definition of science fiction as a publishing category. Mm -hmm. And so you start in 1926 with Gernsback's publication of the pulp magazine, uh, Amazing. Or you talk about science fiction as an epistemological phenomenon, uh, a way of thinking which frees you from history entirely. Uh, you work under the assumption that science fiction, kind of like poetry, lets you think in a way and put ideas together that other forms of literature don't let you put together. And in that sense, you don't have to worry about the historical uh, genealogy. Uh, you just get to talk about the ideas of it. Or you, you broaden it even further, and then you have um, themes, immortality, um, travel to other worlds, and so on. And then that's how you get back to Gilgamesh. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, you can, you can you can broaden it as far as you want, probably. And it, again, it probably depends on your priorities, either as a critic or a reader. Mm -hmm. But there's something different between, you know, Cyrano's voyages, where how, how does he get to the moon and on the back of a goose or something? Mm -hmm. I've completely forgotten. Um, or something like From the Earth to the Moon, where there's some attempt, at least, I mean, a ridiculous attempt to imagine a gigantic cannon that will shoot you into space would kill you first. Um, but uh, 
the, 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 the need to have or the impulse to have a sense that scientific transformation is what's driving these possibilities. Yeah. I mean, in sort retrospect, of separate. yeah, the way the genre looks now, it makes sense probably right. to, to think about science fiction arising alongside industrialization, right. mechanization, scientific progress of some sort or another, yeah. Right. If, you, if you take uh, Dave's suggestion that you look at themes, uh, I've, I've been uh, reading and, and trying to write about a, uh, a book for Rob. Uh, Rob's managing my career at this point, it looks <laughs> like. I only write things for him. Um, but it, the, the book is entitled Imagining Mars, uh, A Literary History. And what the wonderful author of it, Robert Crossley, does is to start out talking about the ways in which Mars was an object of mystery and, and an object that, that spurred the imagination when the only contact that people on Earth could have with it was the naked eye and seeing this kind of pinkish object uh, uh, in the heavens and then how that changed when telescopes were invented and then uh, telescopes get better and then you move to space exploration where you have flybys and then finally you have Mars landers. And along this historical line, um, you, you see science fiction occurring. You know, it, 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 it's kind of like doing archaeology, where you're dealing down, uh, dealing, uh, where you're uh, digging down through levels, and you see the way in which science fiction responded to the theme of Mars, the idea of Mars at this point, this point, this point, this point. So uh, the wonderful thing about science fiction is that it's it's always a kind of mirror. And depending on, on what you put in front of the mirror, whether it's themes or whether it's history or whether it's material culture, uh, you, you, you learn a lot from looking into the mirror. And, and since Dave has given, I mean, since Brooks has given me two plugs for my forthcoming book, I want to give Dave a plug for the book you mentioned, Time Travel, uh, which I read in manuscript. And it's a very, it's a, it's a version of what you're saying Crossley does, uh, you know, for how Mars appears in science fiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a study of the emergence of the time travel subgenre, even before there was what you could call a, a formal category of science fiction yeah. in relation to the evolution and devolution of utopian narratives in the 19th century. So I think that there is a move in uh, genre history to try and trace more, instead of having grandiose definitions of the origins of the genre as a whole, is to trace one thread uh, which is easier to trace historically. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And there's an argument to be made that you don't have a genre or anything for that matter without having a name for it. And the name science fiction is a relatively late invention. The, the late 30s. 20s, yeah. 30s. Mm -hmm. Gernsback in the 20s was calling it scientific fiction and other awkward yeah. Thank stabs goodness that at a was name. Retired. <laughs> and uh, you know, it, it doesn't really come into its own as, a, as a, a distinct body of work until quite a bit after most people have already identified its origin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so then there's, there's the kind of academic thinking that you're engaging in here, but science fiction is also all about popular culture, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it is everywhere in our lives these days. Yeah, and, well, what, what, yeah. what you see underneath the, uh, the, the very thin disguise of academia here, you see three <laughs> fanboys. I mean, you know, that, is, that is the wonderful thing. Uh, a lot of us, I, I know when I started reading science fiction, I, I think I, I started reading Jules Verne. Um, and I, I think I was still in elementary school, and I certainly never thought, ah, I can make a career out of thinking about this <laughs> stuff. Um, but, uh, but, but it is, it is popular culture uh, in, in that it was, I'll put it that way, it was popular culture. Um, just in the span of, of my academic career, we've seen so many distinctions blurred, the distinction between culture and pop culture, high culture and low culture. Uh, at the same time, we've seen a distinction blurred between science and fiction, and we increasingly realize that a lot of science either is fiction or is driven by fiction, and that a lot of fiction, some of it's terrible science, but some of it gets the science right. So as these things have blurred, it's actually become not only safe, but, but really quite, quite uh, rewarding to, uh, to think about science fiction in the academy. Mm -hmm. And I, I, th I think, what was it? Was it in the 50s that Sam Moskowitz taught mm -hmm. the first <clears throat> science fiction? It might have been 1950 or 52, somewhere in there. S and, City College and, in New York. And, and, and now, I, my guess is it'd be very hard to find a major university where there isn't a science fiction course. Right, or someone who does that 
as a specialization. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, to answer your question about pop culture, one of the things that's changed in my lifetime of reading science fiction, Brooks is right, I started reading as a teenager too, um, is that now for my students, science fiction is not primarily a literary phenomenon at all to them. It's a multimedia genre. Um, the explosion of science fiction across the media landscape in the wake of, I think, probably Star Wars in 1977 and 76, whenever it was, um, it's just extraordinary. And, and what's happened is it's kind of fed back so that a lot of the literature, what passes as literature in the bookstores, is a tie-in that's connected to a movie, a television show, a, possibly even a game. Um, I mean, I don't mean to sound disparaging about that. Obviously, it's, it's made people much more aware of science fiction. I think I was just looking at IMDb's list of uh, top box office uh, movies, and I, something like you know, 80% of them are science fiction, um, with loose definitions of science fiction. So that's, that's really new. I mean, you're right, it was always a popular culture phenomenon, but when it was being published in pulp and digest magazines, it had a kind of niche market. Um, and now it's a very broad, mm -hmm. popular market. Do you think that some of that is being driven by what we were saying earlier, that, that you know, science fiction is now rushing to keep up with the technological developments that are sort of unfolding every day? Uh, do, do we live in this space now where a suspension of disbelief is just extremely easy to accomplish? I think so. I mean, um, I, what I do sometimes when I teach science fiction is I ask my students on the first day, since there's not much to do but take role and give them the syllabus, to take out every technological device that they're carrying and put it on their desk. And a small mountain appears in front of many of them. Um, and it becomes very easy to explain to them the idea of being a cyborg, um, being plugged in constantly to digital streams of information. Uh, I try and tell them not to do it when I'm lecturing, but <laughs> it doesn't stop them. Um, and that, that's new. I mean, I remember writing papers in longhand. They stare at me in horror when I tell them that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, I think that the landscape, the technological landscape that, that especially younger generations are growing up with, make them see the genre as almost the kind of realistic fiction. I mean, it's not as implausible as yeah. it might be otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, or David, you no, want to ahead. jump ahead of me here? No, go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not going to uh, simplify things by throwing out another term, and that, that term is uh, postmodernism. I, I'm also, I, I teach uh, a course in postmodern fiction, and there are a zillion uh, definitions of postmodernism, uh, some of them running uh, for hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of pages. But my definition of postmodernism is that it's the culture of the easy edit, and this ties directly into what Rob was talking about. All of us live in a world that is so completely permeated by technological accomplishment, or if not accomplishment, the near certainty that tech is going to have an answer or science is going to have an answer if version 1.0 doesn't fix it, version 2.0 will, and that you can edit the body, you can edit time. We're not mm -hmm. quite to time travel, but you know, uh, my, my second favorite definition of uh, uh, not a definition, but description of postmodernism came from a Dennis the Menace cartoon where Dennis is looking up at his mother and he says, Mommy, why can't we fast forward the microwave? There are a couple of dead technologies already in that. But, you know, I, I lived in a, in a day when if you wanted to bake a potato, you were going to sit for an hour in front of an <laughs> oven at 400 degrees. And with a microwave, you know, suddenly we're editing time. We can get that potato baked pretty quick. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we live in an environment, a technosphere, that is so completely saturated with our thinking about technology or our acceptance of technology in an unthinking way that science fiction, I, I think, quite, quite uh, probably has become the new realism. It, it isn't out there anymore. Uh, how can you have realism that isn't science fictional? You know, one, of the, <laughs> one of the old questions that people who are also interested in defining science fiction or distinguishing it from fantasy used to ask is whether science fiction was predicting science or science was predicting science fiction and so on. And, and um, it strikes me that when we're talking about popular culture and, and for instance, film or, or TV culture, that that question is, is 
interestingly obsolete. And that uh, the, one of the reasons why there's so many science fiction films and TV shows is because it, it's the case that science fiction plots are just especially well suited to the sort of very expensive and now increasingly cheaper special effects mechanisms and, and production mechanisms that, that we use to make films and TV. Um, in terms of how we make images and how we view things, and of course this, this isn't just on TV and, and, and in the theater anymore, obviously it's on our devices as well. It, it's, it's not just that these are science fictional in that old sense that maybe science fiction predicted them or something. It's that the same sorts of problems and, and technologies and pictures and ways of seeing or ways of talking are in, inherent or endemic to these things as they are in, in science fiction stories. They, it's, the, it's the same story that's being told by them. Well, uh, since we're speaking with you for a second here, David, tell us more about this whole tra time travel research you've been doing and, and yeah. Um, tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in going back to before I was working on science, my, my work has always been interested in this, this is related to this question of popular culture, so I'll try to make a segue. <laughs> uh, my work has always been um, interested in, in the ways in which literature or art and criticism or theory do the same things or overlap with one another or anticipate one another. And, and I've been interested from the start in, in um, questioning or possibly getting rid of any kinds of boundaries between what, what both teachers and students called the primary text and the secondary text. So science fiction and especially time travel is an especially interesting medium to think about questions like that. Um, big, time travel stories, uh, in, in the, the way I talk about them, they duplicate a lot of the same kinds of uh, theoretical and critical questions or problems that theorists and critics are asking about other genres, about literature, about film. Um, they do things with time that uh, theorists of literature or stories are interested in doing. Uh, they, they, they theorize dilation and contraction, repetition, um, points of view and, and, and multiple and, and uh, partial points of view and so on and so on. And they do this in the form of, of literal plots and devices, machines. Um, and so they, they, they do it in a kind of intuitive and, and natural way. I think of it as, as literary or cultural theory in situ, you know, <laughs> on the ground. And so that's why I'm interested in them. It's for the same reasons that, I, that I'm interested in, in thinking about the intersections of popular culture and philosophy more generally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and you mentioned, Rob, in a communication we had that um, one of the things that you find most interesting about science fiction is its role as social critic. Well, yeah, I teach a class uh, called Science Fiction and Social Criticism. Um, I mean, there are some influential definitions of science fiction that have been talked about at, at the conference we're attending. Um, that, that basically establish social criticism as a necessary condition of what science fiction is and does. I don't agree with that. I think there's a lot of science fiction that is clearly science fiction, but is very comforting and makes you, and accommodates you to the reality you live in, uh, politically and socially. Um, there are strands in the history of science fiction that are expressly uh, politically and socially critical. I mean, uh, the science fiction of H.G. Wells is often driven by um, political agendas. Uh, the beginning of War of the Worlds, probably the, the first major, certainly the paradigm setting alien invasion narrative, 1898, um, begins with an allusion to the uh, Base, the extermination of the native Tasmanians when that, that, that uh, island was populated by European immigrants. So he sees the history of colonialism as a backdrop behind, against which he's going to tell the story of the earth being colonized from another planet. So he does a kind of reverse colonialism story um, to sort of say to, at that time, the most advanced civilization on our planet, the, the late Victorian British Empire, uh, you know, your comeuppance can come as well. Um, and all the way through in the 1950s, a science fiction magazine called Galaxy Science Fiction was established that really it, its whole purpose was probably was the most consistently social critical popular culture uh, published during the 1950s, a decade when of course you had red baiting and McCarthyism and uh, science fiction became a way of obviously displacing these things into the future or onto other planets. 
but a way to present them critically. Um, and of course, in the 1960s, I mean, the book I'm working on on new wave science fiction uh, of the 60s, totally aligned in many ways with the 60s counterculture, um, with the anti-war movement, uh, with the beginnings of the women's movement. And then in the 70s, you get overtly feminist science fiction. Um, and that's, that's continued. I think it's a strand, though. I don't think it's something that necessarily characterizes what science fiction is, but it's something that science fiction mm -hmm. can do, um, and often do very powerfully, and sometimes in ways that straightforward social satires mm -hmm. can't do. Rob started by uh, uh, re referring to H.G. Wells's War of the Worlds. Uh, here we are talking about Mars again, although tangentially. Uh, and it is, it is the case that, that Wells certainly uh, had a, had a uh, political agenda, an ideological agenda, and a lot of literature about Mars uh, has followed that tradition. There, there are uh, a ton of utopian uh, uh, narratives set, uh, feminist utopias actually, at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century set on Mars, and then there are masculinist uh, uh, utopias, uh, maybe <coughs> utopia is too strong a word uh, if I'm mentioning Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, but, but uh, the, the reason I'm mentioning this is that, for instance, literature about Mars recently has not been driven by any social agenda, it's been driven more by scientific and ethical questions. Uh, the, the, the most noteworthy uh, literature about Mars, the uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars Trilogy, uh, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, basically uh, addresses the idea of, of, of uh, teases out the idea and is haunted by the idea of, of whether ethically it, it would be desirable to try to terraform Mars so that it could support human habitation or to aeroform humans <laughs> to adapt humans so that they could exist in the uh, native ecology of, of Mars. Now, at some level, that if we got you know, serious about it, that would, be, would become a political issue, but it's an ethical debate in, in Robinson, and a lot, of, a lot of science fiction is actually ethical debates, ethical debates about what it means to be human, ethical debates about what it means to meet the other. Um, mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Dave? No, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, Brooks, you had, had mentioned to me that there's a difference sometimes between science fiction film and science fiction literature in terms of the goals they're trying to accomplish. Oh, man, I'm so happy to get to talk about this. <laughs> Good. And here's, here's why. <laughs> we're, we're all gathered, all of us who, who've spent way too much time uh, thinking about and writing about and sometimes arguing about science fiction. We're all gathered here uh, in Iowa City for this wonderful conference, and, and the conference is has focused on science fiction film, on visions of the future and global science fiction. And, and this morning, you, you had an apocalypse uh, because we had wonderful presenters who had brought uh, visual aids, uh, whether, whether it, you know, it was PowerPoint presentations or, or whether it was clips from films or whatever. And they were going to show it to support their papers, and we were in probably the most technologically friendly building on campus, and all of the tech failed. <laughs> you know, the um, uh, you know the the bulb on the projector went out, and and then the computer couldn't couldn't accept signals, and so you had you had these wonderful presentations that were suddenly frustrated, and, and our heroic conference organizers were sweating bullets, you know. But I, I mention all of this simply because it is a reminder that science fiction film is more technological than science fiction <laughs> literature. Uh, a, a, a book is, is a, a work of technology. Uh, in, in fact, my, uh, my favorite definition of a book comes from the science fiction writer uh, Bruce Sterling, who, who pointed out, I, I, I think with tongue in cheek, that a book is a very stable information platform <laughs> well, film, TV, uh, video games, not so stable all the time. And so what happens is that in science fiction film, it is, it is frequently about technology in the way that science fiction literature is, but film also is more of a technology, more of an active and complicated technology. And so when you're looking at a film, 
you're thinking, oh my God, how did they do that? You know, what were the special effects? Um, uh, you're looking at sets, you're looking at things that make you uh, engage with a kind of material aspect of science fiction uh, in an imaginative way quite different from that when you have to imagine everything from just looking at words. And so it isn't surprising that I think science fiction literature would have different agendas perhaps than science fiction film. And we, we can talk about the literary lineage of science fiction literature, but if we're talking about science fiction and film, the literary lineage of science fiction is not nearly as important as the filmic history, you know? It's, it's what happened in other films, uh, and, and, and you have wonderful examples of, of that when you have uh, a film director like Robert Wise, who did uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still, Andromeda Strain, and uh, didn't he do Lassie Come Home at one time? And did Sound of Music uh, also. But what I'm saying is this was not a science fiction guy, this was a film guy, and so very different, different epistemologies at times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Brooks deserves an enormous amount of credit for being a critic who has restored within the genre of science fiction studies the status of science fiction film studies as something that deserves to be seen as valuable and autonomous and not just some version of science fiction literature. Because a lot of the criticism, uh, well, I'll use that term advisedly, a lot of the uh, you know, writings about science fiction film, I think of Frederick Pohl's book, a science fiction writer writing about science fiction film, uh, their claim is basically it's an inferior uh, version of science fiction literature. Um, it, it, certainly a, any adaptation uh, of a science fiction novel uh, is going to be impoverished in terms of the uh, engagement with the really large scale intellectual speculation that a literary text can engage with. And Brooks's book, The Aesthetics of Ambivalence, uh, 91? Uh, 92, I think. 92? Yeah. Okay. Got it close. A long time uh, ago. <laughs> no, not that long. Um, yeah, a long time ago. Uh, not that long, but um, before my current freshmen were born. That's, I guess that's a long time ago. Um, but a book that had a major impact when I read it because I wanted to work on science fiction film as well as science fiction literature, and I didn't want to see science fiction film as kind of a, a poor step cousin. Mm -hmm of what the literature could do because it does things in its own right. It isn't, it isn't, it's a different medium and it, it, the possibilities are different in it. The same story is going to look very different. Um, take for example, one of my favorite science fiction novels, uh, Philip Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, was turned into one of my favorite science fiction films, Blade Runner. They don't look a lot like each other at all. Um, what survived from Philip Dick's novel in that film, uh, you know, there, there are some strands of plot, uh, some character names, um, whole subplots are gone, um, and yet I don't think anyone who works on science fiction film wouldn't acknowledge that as a major, serious classic of the genre. So there's something wrong with a form of criticism that would just set up a definition that automatically made science fiction film or any other media adaptation inferior. Mm -hmm. You agree. point out that, that uh, the term, the very term film is already bordering on obsolete. <laughs> um, it's like a little like calling literature belle lettre or something at this <laughs> point. Um, the, the way in which um, films are produced and also the types of images they show and also um, the types of media we receive them on have um, long ago outstripped the term film. And that's also part of the story or the, or the, the, the set of themes that science fiction is interested in. Yeah. Um, so that, uh, I mean, I, I think about a film like Sleep Dealer, which we'll, we'll be talking about tomorrow morning and then seeing. Um, that, that film is already about the relationship between some of the same political and social topics we've been talking about and the technology of producing imagery. Um, and if science fiction is about anything at this point, it's about that, that whole set of intersections. Um, it's, it, this is what I meant before, I guess, in part by saying that, that uh, in some ways it's much more interesting to see how the, the literature or the, the, the art itself theorizes these problems than to think about how critics do it. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes it's interesting to see how the literature doesn't theorize these problems. Uh, 
uh, Rob was talking about uh, science fiction writers who had a notoriously low opinion of science fiction film. And sometimes in the next breath, uh, that same science fiction writer would say, and why haven't they bought my, uh, my novel to make a movie out of it? You know, like that Woody Allen joke about the food being terrible and the portions are so small. Uh, but but I, I, I mention that because I, I don't think there's nearly that level of, of resistance anymore to, to film because obviously film has become a kind of driving engine of science fiction. And as Dave was pointing out, uh, digital media is, is even more so driving science fiction now. Video games are probably having a much greater impact than film and TV uh, combined. And science fiction on the web is starting, you know, people are f trying to figure out what you can do on the web with science fiction. And once again, I, the irony that has bothered me for some time is that science fiction writers have been not very interested in what was happening with the web. That's changing also, but, but you didn't have a lot of science fiction writers jumping into this new digital world, the electronic world of fiction. They're a little slow, like the rest of us. They're, they're kind of, it's great to imagine change, but it's kind of tough to do it yourself. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, as you mentioned Blade Runner, and we've talked about some other films and, and examples of literature. Give me an idea what your, um, what, what are some films we should all watch? What are some <laughs> of the books that, if we're interested in this topic, we really ought to read because they're just great? Oh, boy. <laughs> or the ones that have been really important. Well, <laughs> first of all, there are too many to keep up with. Sure. But, and and, and I, I gave up. I, I threw up my hands. I, I, wrote a, I wrote a book in which, in the index, when you looked at the films that I referred to, you could find such classics as Hell Comes to Frogtown, <laughs> you know? And, and I was kind of desperate because it was hard to find science fiction films illustrating particular things. And, and I'll just give the curmudgeon answer here. Uh, Rob mentioned Blade Runner. I'm afraid that I've kind of settled, and, and unfortunately, or fortunately, I should say, this wonderful conference has changed my mind because it's made me realize I've got a lot of watching to do. I've got a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> but I kind of reached the point uh, where it seemed to me that after 2001 and Blade Runner, and maybe for historical reasons, if you went back to things to come, there just wasn't much to say about science fiction film. Didn't mean I didn't like watching it and everything, but, but if I was looking for films that really changed my way of thinking about the world, there weren't that many. And I, there are now, I just haven't seen them. I'll leave it to Robin Day. <laughs> Favorites, go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I'll just say, because I agree with Brooks, there's, there's, there are too many to even begin to list. And there are you know, useful lists that you can access. Um, the, the films that I'm working on right now, or at least that I'm looking at again in conjunction with the book on 60s and early 70s to mid 70s science fiction that I'm writing, because I want it to be a book that encompasses a range of media, not just print science fiction, uh, would, would, prob would, would range from uh, 2001, which was a major cultural event. I mean, probably the first science fiction film that was a major cultural event. Um, and of course, a film that was picked up uh, by the counterculture and became a kind of counterculture classic. And there's a lot of writing about um, science fiction film, that in particular, in the fan publications, which I have access to in, in the library at UC Riverside. Um, and I'm fascinated to read it to see the way the fans were seeing uh, the engagement with uh, a certain kind of sense of wonder that they had expected uh, mostly to get from the literature to be now available to them in major, big budget, uh, highly celebrated Academy Award nominated films. Um, all the way through more kind of cult films of the mid 70s like The Man Who Fell to Earth, which is probably my favorite science fiction film. Um, a, a very, very weird film, um, a, almost impossible to describe. Uh, David Bowie is an alien visitor, which goes without saying. Um, <laughs> and um, it, it, it has a kind of odd cons political conspiracy subplot behind it. Uh, it's brilliantly edited. Um, there's one scene that, that, that has become kind of iconic for critics who write about science fiction film, 
where he is sitting in front of an array of screens. Do you remember that scene? So a whole battery of, you know, cathode ray tubes. I know just like old televisions, obviously, um, but all of them uh, with different image streams pouring through them. And the implication is that he has some kind of sensorium that's capable of, of assimilating and integrating all of the information that he's being bombarded with. And it really does suggest actually using media itself, imagery of media itself, this goes back to Brooks's point that science fiction film is often about the media spectacle, uh, to, to, to suggest a truly alien form of consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, and that was another kind of counterculture classic. I remember seeing it at a midnight movie in 1975 at a, at a... You know, part of the problem when you work on, on popular culture studies, and I didn't find this to be the same, uh, to be the case when I was working on philosophy or theory as much, but um, some of the things you, you like are not necessarily the things you, that you think are good. Right. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I, I uh, can think of a very good time travel film from a few years back is, is Primer, a, a low budget film uh, that some of you I'm sure have seen, but not everyone because it's a little hard to find. Um, but uh, I don't hard find... Hard to understand also. Yeah, hard to understand. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of what's good about it. Um, but it's, it's not something I personally can say much about, or if I, if I had to produce a reading of it here, I probably couldn't at the moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, for instance, uh, a film came out is it last year or two years ago, The Adjustment Bureau with Matt Damon, which I don't think is a very good film, but I actually like that film quite a lot, mm -hmm. uh, speaking as a critic. I can, I can find a lot to say about that. Um, and I, I think that and it works the same way with literature. I mean, one of my favorite um, uh, books, for instance, is, is a, a relatively obscure uh, hard SF novel by Larry Niven called World Out of Time which I find absolutely fascinating. I'm quite sure it's not a very good book. <laughs> um, but that's not the problem for me. It's yeah, not the issue. Yeah. yeah. Well, just to wrap up this little segment, uh, kind of a big question, I suppose, but why does so much science fiction seem to me, anyway, to be a dark vision of the future? You said some can be kind of comforting and make you feel good about where we might all be going, but there are an awful lot of bleak pictures of the future. And yeah, it's, it's uh, what, what does that tell in us? That sense, right? yeah. And yeah. It's realism. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, well, the dystopia has definitely, in the 20th century, and especially in the second half of the 20th century, displaced the utopia at the center of science fiction. Um, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that, because you know every generation starts to write its own dystopias. Um, and eco ecological catastrophe now, of course, that goes back even to the 50s and 60s, but within the context of global warming, I mean, that's a major thread in a lot of science fiction. Um, I, I do think it has to do with the sense that uh, partly it's fear of the changes that people are living through, but um, also a lack of confidence uh, since the 50s that, that science, science and technology are necessarily going to save us from mm -hmm. predicaments that perhaps they've contributed in getting us into. And so the technological confidence of earlier science fiction is compromised since then, and you, you do get darker, mm -hmm. darker portraits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Things got a little darker when the atomic bomb <laughs> yeah, <laughs> went off. <laughs> Uh, there's a, uh, I, lo I love bumper stickers. Uh, I love their linguistic uh, constructions. Uh, bumper stickers are not great philosophy, but one bumper sticker that is incorrect, but it, it's pretty good about science fiction, is that science fiction doesn't exist to predict the future, but to prevent the future. <clears throat> so the darkness, in one sense, is really optimistic because it says, hey, if we show a future that's crummy enough, maybe we can avoid it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you know, you asked uh, if we had recommendations for good or uh, science fiction film or, or books, and you know, one of the things that that tends to make a good book is the um, is a the ambiguity of, of the um, of the outcomes or the or the philosophical implications, and b the the um, avoidance of strict generic conventions, and that makes for dystopian rather than utopian endings for the most part. Yeah. Wow. Well. Thank you, you guys, for being up here. David Wittenberg and Brooks Landon and Rob Latham, I'm going to keep you here for the next segment. Please say thanks to our guests. It was terrific. Thanks. <laughs>
And so I'd like to invite uh, Istvan Chicheri Rone and uh, Sherilyn Arbaugh to join us here. In the next few minutes, we're going to focus specifically on a couple of things, how science fiction addresses technology and the body, and science fiction in the state, looking at recurrent themes such as the hero, hero as a rebel or an outlaw, threat of mind control by a centralized state um, or the state's enforcers, and also the loss of personal freedom. Uh, so let me introduce our two new guests, Sher Sherilyn Arbaugh. Arbaugh is a professor of Asian Studies and Women and Gender Studies at the University of British Columbia, and she's a specialist in modern Japanese popular culture. Her research addresses issues of race, gender, sexuality, and visuality in Japanese fiction, film, manga, and anime. Thank you, Sherilyn, for being with us. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And at the far end is Istvan Chicherny Rone, and uh, he's a professor of English at DePaul University in Indiana, co editor of Science Fiction Studies and Humanimalia, a journal of human animal interface studies. So we have to learn more about that. Uh, let me start with you, Sherilyn. Um, let's talk about cyborgs and mm -hmm. uh, what they are. When did they come into science fiction? And uh, what are some of the interesting human and technological questions that these cyborgs raise? I can really only speak about Japanese cyborgs. Uh, but that's a huge thing to talk about because they're all over Japanese science yeah, fiction. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to say where they start. Some people trace the cyborg in Japanese culture back to the 12th century uh, to stories about giving life to inanimate creatures and having them actually be able to function as humans. Um, but as, as Rob and the others were talking about a moment ago, science fiction really starts in Japan in the 19th century. And that's when the image of the cyborg, or at least the, the, the animated uh, android sort of thing, a machine that can live, really becomes extremely popular. A cyborg, of course, is not the same thing as an android. A cyborg is an amalgamation between the organic and the machinic. And uh, in Japan, that becomes really an important figure in science fiction after World War II. Would you like to say something about the cyborg? Well, you're the expert on the Japanese cyborg, and uh, it seems to me that half the cyborgs in the world are in Japan, so um, that, that's important. Um, it, actually, I'm, my background is uh, both, both my upbringing and my original tastes were very what we would call humanistic. So I was dragged kicking and screaming into the world of uh, cyborgs. But really, resistance is futile. It's uh, absolutely um, a dominant um, uh, theme in contemporary life. Um, uh, the, the story that Brooks was telling about, or that Rob was telling about putting the, um, all the devices uh, on the table and saying, well, this is where cyborgs start. Um, it's, it's pretty obvious now, certainly to younger generations, especially one, a generation that's grown up on the internet and with all mm -hmm. the uh, little devices. And Kate Hales in her, her um, talk was uh, predicting a future, uh, the cloud future, when uh, essentially all human connections will be made through these, these devices and the app will be the, the, the most important cultural object. Um, so uh, the, the cyborg is, is kind of an image of this technological transformation of um, human culture. It's, it also clearly causes uh, serious philosophical and moral questions to be raised, but of course so did the human being. Uh, one of the most important ones is what's the relationship between your, one's sense of subjective identity and, uh, and what's, what's one's social determination. The technology would be really, really strong intervention by society into uh, personal identity. Um, uh, and, and even, well, some people are very, very pro-cyborg um, and anti-innerness. Um, but most people, even when they completely acknowledge these transformations, uh, and love the literature of cyborgs. They they also love the 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 anxiety and the and the tension and the suspense that comes with um, dealing with how much how much of this is dangerous and how much of this is something I don't want. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and there has been, uh, recently there have been television programs where, you know, obviously there's been some sort of alien intrusion into a population, but you don't know, you know, you think you're talking to somebody who's just like you, but then you find out later on that they're not. This is, this is a very popular theme these days. Uh, in, is this what you're discovering too since the 60s? Has this become more and more part, uh, part oh, of science it, it, fiction? Oh, you know, it's been around at least since, in, in science fiction film, at least since the 50s with a film like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, mm -hmm. and probably the best science fiction film of the 50s. Um, there it's aliens deposit pods, seed pods on Earth that can perfectly imitate human beings um, with the goal of eventually replacing all human beings with these pod people. And what's interesting is that, that you can trace the influence, kind of cultural influence of science fiction is obviously some kind of commentary on conformity and whether you saw it as a kind of you know, anxiety about communism or an anxiety about the conformity of American suburbia. You have critics reading it either way. Um, the term pod people starts to appear in editorials and op-ed pages, you know, within a year or two after that movie. So um, I, I think if you said pod person, most people would kind of know what you meant. Um, in the same way that the word robot uh, spins out of, uh, you know, a, a Czech play from 1920, um, by the middle of the 1920s, that play had been translated into most European languages, and the term was a quite popular term, um, so that a movie like uh, uh, Metropolis comes out with a robot in it, and some weird kind of cyborgization happens in it, the transfer of a woman's identity, consciousness, spirit, whatever exactly, into the machine. Um, and so these images go back uh, you know, fairly far. Um, the ambiguity is cl fairly clear that the Mariah that's produced by the evil scientist Rotwang, which is a great name for an evil scientist, um, <laughs> Rotwang, that's not a good person, is, uh, and he appears, you know, in front of a pentagram and he has a kind of, you know, mechanical Dr. Strangelove hand and he makes these extravagant gestures and you know he's up to no good. Um, you're not going to confuse her with the real Mariah, although apparently the workers do. I mean, they fall under her spell when she does this very strange, seductive dance, one of the weirdest scenes in the history of world cinema. <laughs> and um, I, I think that theme of the ambiguity of the artificial and its possible substitutability for the human, I might even go back to the, you know, the invention of fairly lifelike automatons in the 18th century, you know, the Bocasson's duck yep. that could eat and excrete, uh, the chess playing automaton. Um, but I, I do think that the, the, the cyborgization that Ishvan's referring to, that we actually experience and live through, has given this a wider currency and intensity for people because it's not hard, as mm -hmm. I said in the previous segment, to convince my students that they are cyborgs. Uh, I actually, right. I, I learned this from Sherilyn, actually, that, that um, I, I, when I first heard the term cyborg, I would use it and think of it very much in terms of pod people or, you know, that's, that robot, right? But now, it's perfectly, somebody may well be using it as a positive term. Um, there was a, a, a wonderful paper on a wonderful new South Korean movie called I'm a Cyborg and That's Okay. Um, and it was actually Sherilyn describing the Japanese attitude um, to it that made me realize that this is a term that is radically ambiguous. Mm -hmm. huh. Well, and uh, forgive me if this is just too simplistic and um, just kind of a dumb question, but you know, when we're living in an age where an entire face transplant can happen, when you know, hearts are transplanted on a daily basis, um, new limbs, I, where, where are we in the world of cyborgs now? I mean, are, are many of us part of this, this, uh, this genre of, of being? When science can put a heart in Dick Cheney, we're in a brave new world. <laughs> um, I, You'd have to find a place for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I suppose there, there is obviously uh, more than a theoretical limit to the substitutability of human 
parts and functions, uh, mm -hmm. and the, the capacity of machines, however complicated, to imitate or replace them. Um, but, uh, you know, what I would have said was impossible 10 years ago is a lot of it is possible. Mm -hmm. um, there are scientists who believe, gerontologists who believe, that they can turn off the cellular mechanisms that cause aging. And so theoretically, life extension into an, an, the second century is feasible within, maybe not within my lifetime, <laughs> uh, but I'm having my head frozen so they can bring me back. <laughs> um, so yeah, and others mm -hmm. want to? Sure. Um, Catherine Hales has argued that already we are all cyborgs, as has Donna Haraway. And I would certainly agree. It, it depends, of course, on how you define the cyborg. Uh, but one definition is a being that has been reprogrammed to survive in the environment that it needs to be in. This is how the word cyborg came about in the right. first place in the 1960s uh, through NASA scientists talking about how human beings could be changed, could be amalgamated with various kinds of technology to live in outer space without needing spacesuits and that kind of thing. So by that definition, uh, anyone who's been immunized has been reprogrammed to resist disease in the environment that we live in. So in, even in that most simple sense, we're all cyborgs. Mm -hmm. But as you said, people have heart transplants. My mother has had multiple surgeries and has all sorts of technology in her body. She's a walking cyborg. Um, <laughs> but we all are. Many of the science fiction uh, films or, or pieces of literature that deal with the cyborg are trying to look at something that's much more kind of graphically physical. And they're interested in the interface. Where does the machine stop and the meat body start? Um, and how do those things work together? And I think of the scene in um, the, the final Star Wars, where Anakin Skywalker has been horribly burned. And he's being put into his kind of mechanical suit that's going to keep him alive for the rest of his life. And he sees the helmet coming down onto his head. And we get his point of view, and we see the helmet coming down too. And this horrible vision of being forever dependent on technology to live, it, it's, a, it's a terrible thing. I don't want to get too much into Japan right away, but a lot of Japanese cyborg depictions are much more gentle about that interface mm -hmm. and about how, what a beneficial or, or positive experience mm -hmm. it can be. Well, and it's interesting, it just hit me that we, we almost reflexively, in conversations like this, start talking about the, the, the physical prosthetics and the apps and, and whatnot. But, but the, cyborg, the cyborg is also, and um, now that Haraway's name has been mentioned, the cy cyborg is also um, a, a kind of a new system of relationships as well. So the cyborg would be, one aspect would be a social one of uh, a, a being whose social existence is acknowledged to be in a, in a network of sort of communicational relationships, like a node in a network, but with a certain autonomy to, to keep changing his or her position, or his or her, no, a cyborg also in a certain sense wouldn't have to be, it could be post-gender. So, um, so it's, it, it, it seems to me, it made more sense to me to, to understand the cyborg as a new set of social relationships, a new global set of social relationships, instead of focusing on the, on the transformations of the body. A person can have a heart transplant, can, can, get a, can get a life extension iron mask or something and still feel um, sort of connected to very old traditions and still kind of live the subjective life of an, of an old school human being. But, uh, but socially, a cyborg would, be, uh, would reject all that, would consider those things not that important. What's important is this constant movement and realignment in a network of communicational relationships. Mm -hmm. The internet, <laughs> right, right, right. for instance. Well, you know, this sort of made me think of a film you've already mentioned, 2001, and that moment where, where Hal doesn't follow commands anymore. Hal is telling Dave, no, Dave, I'm sorry, I can't do that, which sort of sounds like Siri on the new iPhones to me. I think of that when a friend of mine is trying to make a call on the iPhone, and um, Siri says, I'm sorry, I can't do that for you. I think, oh my gosh, you know, 
we we are living uh, obviously she's responding to something that she simply can't do i understand what's happening there but it does make you think that there is something operating in there that we don't control that we can't control well you know that the, someone uh, a colleague of ours uh, lisa yasek pointed this out to me um and I, you know, I, I just recently got uh, the newer version of uh, the iPhone with Siri. If you say to Siri, open the pod bay doors, Hal, <laughs> she will say, oh no, not that again. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes she says, we all know what happened to Hal now, don't we? <laughs> so some, 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 some tech person with a sense of humor uh, <laughs> program that device. Um, <laughs> Well, that, that's a good point because the theme of um, resistant technology, uh, it appears in, in, in some cyborg films, including some Japanese cyborg films like Tetsuo the Iron Man, mm -hmm. where the body is invaded by really more kind of industrial technology than, than high tech, you know, cybernetic technology. And, 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 and there's this war that goes on between the machine parts and the meat parts, as you mm -hmm. put it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think, I think the, the possibility of being in control of technology becomes particularly pointed when the technology is a large part of your self-definition. Mm -hmm. What does that even mean anymore? Yeah, and, and this, the, the the cy cyborg is also, I think, uh, a popular concept because of the way the word is constructed. Mm -hmm. Because it's a, it's a word that violates a, a boundary uh, that once was a very sacred boundary. <laughs> and um, and it's, it, it actually, in many formulations, it doesn't have to be technological. It, you, you, could, you could be a cyborg entirely socially and not not be conscious of the technology, but most of the time it is associated with it. And so we see um, it kind of as an emblem and a cause for the breakdown of an awful lot of boundaries that were once considered really secure. And, and there's a, a sense of anxiety um, that's actually quite creative, quite, quite inspiring, an anxiety, um, if that makes sense, an inspiring anxiety. Um, <laughs> Uh, about dealing with with boundaries that still exist kind of spectrally. They're there, we, have, we talk about them, they're in our words, um, but we don't know where they, where they actually demarcate anymore. And there's, of course, a sense of tremendous liberation and elation that, that these, these boundaries, these things that kept us from, from doing things, mm -hmm. from wanting things, from saying things, are now, have, are now coming down. Um, and that, then that causes anxiety, uh, and then that causes elation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, in, in these next few minutes, could we just spend a second talking about sort of um, science fiction visions of the state, state domination, um, um, you know, individuals no longer having even the level of freedom many of us feel we have today, um, state control, mind control, all of these kinds of uh, sort of political representations in various science fiction um, films or literature. Can you speak to that at all? Um, so science fiction about, about state control? Uh, yeah, state control or, you know, um, mind control, these things where, where the, the rebel maybe is, is uh, the, the one person. We're going to talk to Alex Rivera here in just a minute about his film, Sleep Dealer, and we'll get into this then too. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the sort of political side to this. Well, the, 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 the dystopias of state control, that's, a, that's, a, that's an old form, actually not all that old, the, the, the sort of the, the great seminal work of that um, by Evgeny Zamyatin in uh, we, we in 1921 um, Zam was written in the Soviet Union and um, was not published in uh, the, the Soviet, uh, as far as I know, it was nev never published in the Soviet Union. It was published in Russian after, uh, after the fall. I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about that, but it was very, very Late and Samyatin was long dead, um, and it it uh, in, is said to have inspired um, Brave New World by uh, Aldous Huxley uh, and 1984 by Orwell. And there's there's that tradition. Clockwork Orange is a much more um, ambiguous version, but there too there's a kind of affirmation that it's better to be. Uh, a violent thug and free than to be uh -huh. administered by, by the state. But um, 
it's, the reason why I hesitated is because um, I was trying to think of counterexamples. So examples of the dystopia of the free market. There is one absolutely phenomenally wonderful work called The Space Merchants um, that tells of a future that is uncannily like our present, um, in, in which essentially um, advertising corporations have taken over the world. Um, and, but uh, for, I think, complex reasons that I haven't thought enough about, um, those kinds of dystopias are relatively rare. I think we're going to see more and more of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When the cyborg breaks down boundaries, uh, uh, it allows things in. Mm -hmm. And so, one, to, to just kind of bring the cyborg back to this question of the state, so one subgenre, I guess, of science fiction deals with the way the body can be hacked, the body and the mind can be hacked by various kinds mm. of organizations, sometimes state, sometimes mm -hmm. terrorist. Um, and, and that radical openness to uh, information that may be damaging to oneself is one of the dystopian visions mm -hmm. that I think we have. I mean, the film The Matrix, uh, you know, is the kind of connects that all, both of these points together. Um, I don't think it's a very good film, but it, it certainly is an emblematic film of the popularization of a certain idea of the complete in, in invasibility of the human body, sensorium, um, the, the, the sense that everything we experience could be an administered illusion um, just because we're so plugged in that our reality can be hacked. Um, and it's easy to, to say, you know, the matrix is now just a kind of shorthand for my students. Well, some of them have never even seen it, but because um, I guess it is, what, 10 years old? Um, it has become a shorthand for what they see as uh, an image of, is, there, is it a state that's doing this? It, isn't it, I'm, not, I don't, I'm seeing the trilogy, so I'm not a totally aliens. clear. Aliens. Aliens are doing it. Yeah. That's right. Oh, yes, the, yeah. right, yeah, of course. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you, um, uh, the the Matrix is is a good example in science fiction. Earlier, we were talking about the kind of uh, we're getting at a point where sometimes it's hard to whether we should consider something science fiction or not. Or everyone will agree it's not science fiction. But why am I? Why do I feel like I'm watching it a science fiction? Speaking to this point, uh, the TV show Twenty Four was nobody ever talked about that as being uh, science fiction. But after a while, and I watched it religiously, after a while I got the feeling that it was actually being narrated by all those communication devices and surveillance devices. So if we, all we had done was switch 24 around so that instead of um, all that, all those surveillance devices and ways of infrared looking into buildings and all that technology, which we don't necessarily have, George Bush thought we had it, but, um, but we will have them, it's, it's pretty sure. If it had been flipped around, and instead of the good guys having them, but the bad guys had, that would have been science fiction. Yeah. And, and, and that raises the interesting issue of the politics of it. It could have been exactly the same story. In fact, it could have been just as realist, just as realistic. But um, at that point, the, uh, the sort of the culture would have bristled and said, oh, that's too scary to be acceptable. <laughs> What's interesting is that, that it just occurred to me that the most popular works of literary science fiction, broadly popular with an audience that does not think of itself as science fiction readers, are works of state dystopia. Um, from Brave New World to 1984 to Fahrenheit 451, I mean, these are books that have sold the millions of copies and uh, not necessarily to science fiction readers. So there is something about, um, and all of them are about, well, I can't remember the exact outcome of Fahrenheit 451, but the others are about failed attempts at rebellion against that state system. Uh, the kind of weird anti-hero savage figure in, uh, in Brave New World hangs himself at the end. Uh, and of course, we know what happens to poor Winston Smith in uh, you know, basically kind of radically reprogrammed. Um, and it's odd that that has been the most resonant, popular image of science, literary science fiction for people who aren't science fiction Well, readers. I'm sure a lot of it had to do with the, the 
polarization, political polarization, global, um, so that the West was, um, for very complex reasons, essentially in a demonizing relationship with communism, and communism was the thing that um, represented social evil altogether. Um, uh, it's interesting to see how, how science fiction in the Soviet Union, for instance, uh, dealt with these issues. Um, in some cases, um, it was semi-dissident semi literature. It was done, done very obliquely, but the same sorts of critiques of state, state power um, w were you know, made into, into mainly literary fiction. But you would also get sometimes quite effective um, satires uh, and dystopias about uh, Western societies where the entire population is drugged out on technologies and, and drugs. Yeah, yeah. What a strange idea. <laughs> Wow. Well, thank you for joining us for this segment. Uh, Rob Latham, of course, and Sherilyn Arbao, you'll be with us a little bit later. And you too, Istvan uh, Chicherny Rone. So thank you so much for this. Thanks. And I'd like to invite our next guest up. We're going to be talking next to Alex Rivera. Before that, I'd like to remind you that you're listening to World Canvas, a production of international programs at the University of Iowa. We invite you to watch the rebroadcast of this program on UITV or listen on Iowa Public Radio or KRUI-FM. And links to the broadcast can be found at International Program's website, international.uiowa.edu. You can listen to the full series of programs as a podcast on iTunes. Our next program, uh, the last one of this year's uh, season will be on Friday, May 4th in this room. I hope you can come. And the topic that night is art and memory. That's 5 o'clock Friday, May 4th. So welcome, Alex Rivera. So good to have you here with us. Thanks. It's wonderful wonderful to be here, John. Well, thanks. I, I uh, um, will give a fuller introduction here in just a moment, but we've already had some reference to your film, Sleep Dealer. Mm -hmm. And I want to let everybody know that this film will be shown tomorrow night at the Bijou Theater here on campus, 9 o'clock. So you're invited to uh, see the film then. Alex Rivera is a New York-based digital media artist and filmmaker. His first feature film, Sleep Dealer, premiered at Sundance in 2008 and won two awards, including the Waldo Salt Screenwriting Award. Rivera is a Sundance Fellow and a Rockefeller Fellow. His work, which addresses concerns of the Latino community through a language of humor, satire, and metaphor, has also been screened at the Berlin International Film Festival, uh, New Directors, New Films, the Guggenheim Museum, PBS, Telluride, and other international venues. And once again, the film will be shown tomorrow night if you're interested in seeing Sleep Dealer. That's part of the current conference, Visions of the Future, Global Science Fiction Cinema. So let's learn something about your life. And you know, or where, where did you get started? Um, you grew up in New York, did you? I was born in New York City and uh, raised in upstate New York. And yeah. uh, my uh, my father's from Peru, um, oh. and he came to the United States in the you know about 50 years ago when he was in his early 20s. Yeah. And um, as a child, I sort of fell in love with science fiction, um, and I also uh, fell in love with. Um, a different form of science fiction, which is to me activism and politics. That is a different, uh, a different form of science fiction in the sense that science fiction is always um, about one way or another imagining alternate realities, imagining the future. Um, politics and activism is uh, is science fiction in that sense because you're always trying trying to alter the course of history, trying to right. alter the reality we live in. And so when I was young in, in upstate New York, I met Pete Seeger, um, the uh, sort of legendary folk musician whose songs were part of a, a whole a ra range of uh, social movements. And um, through him, I got interested in culture and politics and ultimately would kind of mix it all together, um, making films and videos that tried to impact on political conversations and um, along the way started to play with this sort of this this form that I'd loved my my whole life science fiction yeah yeah and well I know that you have produced a number of short films a number of short pieces as well but could we talk a little bit about sleep dealer without giving away any of the specific plot line um, it, it deals with uh, we were just talking about the state and mm -hmm. individuals maybe not having much freedom within the state uh, immigration is a big issue um, uh, sort of corporate realities or, or imagined corporate realities uh, in this world this young man's living in. Um, what can you tell us about the, about the creation of this story and the life this central character lives? Sure. Well, um, 
I guess the first thing I would say is, is, is when a country refers to, as, as America does right now, to 15 million of its inhabitants as aliens, um, including some of my family members, um, don't be surprised when we start to make science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know? uh, and uh, so the, uh, you know, Sleep Dealer is a film set in a, in a near future in which the border between the United States and Mexico is highly militarized, uh, slightly more than it is today. And, um, and yet there's another impulse which is also occurring today, which is the world is highly connected. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, there's a very robust internet that crosses all borders. And so there's a kind of contradiction there. Borders on the ground are militarized, but borders kind of in the digital space are very robust and connect everybody. And what that produces for my main character, who's from a small village and uprooted and a kind of traditional immigrant story in some ways, um, heads north to work in a city, um, he ends up hitting that closed border and he can't cross. And he ends up in a factory where he connects his body uh, to this futuristic internet and uh, controls a machine in North America, in the United States, uh, that does his labor. So his pure labor energy crosses the border, but his body stays out. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's... Uh, the, the, the concept of the film started off as a joke. It was meant to be kind of humorous and absurd. Um, over the years, it's sort of slowly started to occur in our, in our lived reality, or it gets closer and closer to occurring in our lived reality. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the film resonates on a few levels. I hope it's fun, um, and uh, it's got some... Um, you know, explosions and robots and uh, <laughs> partial nudity and, uh, you know, the, the, the pleasures of, of the cinema. But then it's also yeah. got, um, you know, it also has uh, reflections on um, what it means to be um, kind of alienated mm -hmm. and uh, distanced from the, uh, the, the, what we produce, mm -hmm. which is, I think, a, a very human um, experience in the 21st century. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's there's a, a line that just was incredibly um, striking to me as I watched this film, and it was when the young man's being led into this uh, um, new job he's going to have, and uh, the guy showing him around says, "Yeah, as usual uh, in the U.S., they want the work, but they don't want the workers." Something along that that's line. Right. Uh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah, there, so that's that's the boss of the factory sort of explaining the. The, the dynamic um, that the system uh, is part of, and it's the, the work without the workers. And uh, it's a sort of simple way of putting to me um, the posture um, that the United States has always kept a kind of, to me, I think we need to call it what it is. It's a caste of people. And in, the, in this country right now, for example, the people that produce the most intimate product, uh, the food that we eat, for example, uh, you know, uh, the, that is a, a group of people whose work is almost in, um, unimaginably difficult and yet who are legally excluded, literally excluded from minimum wage, excluded from protections. And so there's this, and, and that's not a new phenomena in this country, it's a sort of phenomena that's been a, 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 a continuation or a continuity through the centuries. Mm -hmm. You know, it's taken different shapes and different forms, but there's always been a group of people who've done the kind of hardest work in the society, and yet for one reason or another, are kind of locked out legally from fully participating in the fruits of the society. And um, so there's this idea of somehow we need the work, but wish there weren't workers. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd love to extract that energy that labor is from the body, but don't want to care for it, don't want to, uh, don't want to give it health care, don't want to uh, let it go to school. Mm -hmm. And that, that sort of tearing feeling of like pulling and pushing at the same time Mm -hmm. um, that's a bit what the film tries to visualize, uh, again, in, in a playful and fun way. It's not, yeah. it's, it's, it's not dour Marxism. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's fun Marxism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and, and uh, we talked earlier about uh, things like the degradation of the environment. Now, this has been a concern for many, many years, science fiction writers, and, and that's one of the issues uh, related to this young man's home and, and uh, also his growth as, as an individual, not really realizing maybe what home was all about when he had it. Sure. Well, you're referring to um, you know the first act of the film, and and when we set up um, the main character, his his name is Memo, and we, we when we set up his uh, village, there's a dam there, and there's a river that's run by his village traditionally and allowed for a kind of subsistence agriculture type of um, living and sustainability, and that's been interrupted by the very um, you know very visual imposition of a dam. And, um, and that dam is installed by a corporation which is trying to 
privatize the, the water flow. Mm -hmm. And again, this isn't science fiction. This is that that part is a uh, a period piece, or it's a, <laughs> it's, it's history, really, because that's obviously been happening um, around the United States and around the world. That companies like like Nestle or in in, uh, in South America, Bechtel in Bolivia, have been actively trying to um, you know turn water, um, which is what we're made of, you know, 90% mm -hmm. of our bodies or whatever the number is, mm -hmm. but uh, turn it into a, a commodity. And so that's kind of the backdrop for my characters leaving his village and heading north and is a reference to these kind of circles that I see um, in the sense that a lot of immigrants when they come here um, they get wrapped up in a whole political discussion right that's happening it's very sort of vicious and vibrant and, and, and powerful in this in the US right now and it often makes the immigrant seem like they're making decisions on their own. Like they just mm -hmm. woke up and decided, I want to go to America to make my life it's to make my life better. That's how we frame it. But we never put it in the context of the fact that the US as an entity has been a migrant, meaning that the US has had uh, corporations, whether it's the United Fruit Company or a whole panoply of mine operations or oil companies or any kind of thing in Latin America for centuries. Uh, we've had our Marines in all kinds of countries in Latin America for centuries. And so we, as a nation, have migrated south and often created the kind of backdrop for individuals to take the decision to come here. And so immigrants are part of a long historical uh, continuum. And in my film, again, which is fun to watch, um, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, that, that dynamic is embodied by this dam and this kind of uh, corporate influence being present in his village. And so mm -hmm. there's a kind of shadow of, um, of, 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 of the US in his village before he leaves and heads north. And so mm -hmm. he's part of this uh, back, and, back and forth, which immigration, it's, it's really urgent that we start to understand migration from Latin America, Latin America to the US as part of a, a continuum and, and a back and forth mm -hmm. between, between us and them. Yeah. Well, and you've done a really nice job building sort of, I, I think, very well fleshed out characters. You see real human mm -hmm. sides to these people who are, you know, they have mm -hmm. many dimensions. Uh, the, the young woman in the story, uh, the, the fellow who was part of the police force. Um, is there anything you can say about that without giving away too much? Sure. Um, uh, you know, um, I would say as a, as a filmmaker and a writer, um, I'm much more comfortable talking about kind of intellectual issues. I, I know um, in the, in, with some of the previous guests there was a uh, discussion about how science fiction is, is uh, about the setting often and about speculating on worlds. And, you know, I, I, when I entered into it, I, that's what I, that was my primary impulse, was to try to think about where the world is headed and some of these contradictions I've been... Um, trying to detail. And then at a certain point, you say, I can't really make a feature film just with a setting. I need, pe you know, I, <laughs> as much as I would like to. You need, uh, you know, you need characters. And so, you know, the writing process took about seven years. And mm -hmm. a lot of that was coming up with the characters, um, relationships between them altering, um, and trying to design the, the plot and, and that it come from um, personal and, and motivations. And that is the balance, and it's often a tough thing in science fiction because when you imagine an alternate reality, you're, you're doing that because you, you wanna say something about the system we live in. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not imagining a, a, a future world to then tell a story about a, a kid doing a high school play that goes bad. You know, mm -hmm. you, you know <laughs> yeah, you're, right. you're, 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 when you imagine a future world, it's because that's the thing you want to uh, say yeah. something about. Yeah. And then you need to, but, 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 like, but that journey needs to be lived by an individual. Mm -hmm. And there's always a bit of a disjunction there where uh, you, you feel in science fiction creations, books and film, that there's a pull because the author wants to explore our society, but it needs to be done through individuals. And mm -hmm. so for me, that was the, the tension. I borrowed a lot of um, facts and kind of textures from my, my dad's life, from people who I'd met making documentary mm -hmm. films, and tried to weave that into um, the characters' voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what are you working on now? Um, let's see, I'm working on two projects. Um, one is I'm... Uh, working on a, a basically a, what they call a Bible, which is kind of interesting. It's not a 
Quran or something, anything else, but a Bible for a television series. Um, and uh, it's a science fiction um, concept which has to do with uh, the future of the camera. I've been interested in the kind of physicality of the camera and the idea that at one point in time there was only one camera on the planet, right? Yeah. Like when it was invented and it was a fairly large machine and how since then the camera's been shrinking and multiplying and now there's you know, billions of cameras and they're tiny and uh, I remember as a kid, you used to have to wait like a week to yeah, see the right, images, right. and now there's no waiting at mm -hmm. all. And so these, the size shrinking, the amount of time it takes to see the images compacting, mm -hmm. uh, the number of cameras exploding, and where, where, where does that go? And to me, it's, it's very clear where it goes is it's the camera merges with the body, mm -hmm. uh, the camera goes into our eyes, and we're able to share what we see. Um, instantly, and um, so I've got a character who's a young woman who has these these things kind of stuck in her eyes, and um, it doesn't all go as smoothly as, <laughs> as intended. We'll put it leave it there. Um, so I'm working on that project, and then separately, I'm working on a documentary, which is um, well, since it's a documentary, I guess it's necessarily not science fiction, even though it's a, a story that I think has some sci-fi qualities. It's a story of um, uh, a network, I guess, of young um, people, undocumented youth. So these are people who were brought to the United States when they were two or three years old, grow up here, feel very American. Um, they're young people from here, I mean, the, who grew up here, but who don't have a social security number and have reached a level of frustration that they've started to um, organize themselves and do protest actions where they get ar arrested mm -hmm. and confront uh, deportation directly as an act of protest and kind of hurl their bodies at the legal system to try to figure out, like, am I here or am I not? Mm -hmm. You know, and to really um, test uh, this contradiction, which is that they, they've been here for their whole lives and yet they're told you don't belong here. Mm -hmm. And it is a, I, and to me, that is a virtual reality. It's a science fiction state of being, a kind of suspension mm -hmm. that these young people live through, millions of them, and a, 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 a group of them have had it mm -hmm. and uh, are full of laughter, joy, rebel energy, and also determined to like crack the system a little bit and try to figure out who they are, where they, where they are, yeah. and are doing it through these protest actions. And so I've been working with them on a film. Wow. Well, I look forward to seeing both of those, and, and many, many thanks for coming to talk with oh. us tonight, and a real pleasure. Oh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Joe. <laughs>so once again, Alex Rivera's film will be shown tomorrow night at the Bijou Theater here on the university campus, 9 o'clock. And I'd like to invite our last uh, group of guests up now. That will include Nathaniel Isaacson, uh, Istvan will be back up here with us, also Sherilyn, uh, Rachel Haywood Ferreira, and Sami Khan. So please join us here. In this part of the program, we're going to delve a little more deeply into science fiction as a global genre. You've already met Sherilyn and uh, Istvan. And joining them now are, on the far end, Rachel Haywood. Ferreira, and then next to her is Nathaniel Isaacson, Isaacson excuse me, and Sami Khan is here as well. So, thanks for joining us. Uh, Rachel Haywood Ferreira teaches Spanish in the Department of World Languages and Cultures at Iowa State University, and she's written on the emergence of Latin American science fiction, is particularly interested in the roots of the genre in Latin America and in the North, and she's currently working on the science fiction of the space race era in Latin America, as seen in genre magazines and comics, as well as anthologies. Thanks for being with us, Rachel. Uh, Nathaniel Isaacson teaches in the Department of Foreign Languages and Literatures at North Carolina State University with particular interest in Chinese literature and cultural studies, especially science fiction and cinema. His current writing examines the history of Chinese science fiction through the contemporary period, and uh, Nathaniel, as I understand it, also founded a website on Chinese science fiction. So thanks for being with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Sami Khan is a PhD research scholar working on the confluence of technology, culture, and society in India. Sami is currently teaching Hindi as a Fulbright foreign language teaching assistant here at the University of Iowa in the Department of Asian and Slavic Languages. And he's engaged in film production, teaching, theater, and writing in his career so far. Uh, so I'll start with you three folks at the end uh, right away. I can you tell us something about the science fiction that is um, popping up in places that we might normally not associate with science fiction? Uh, Rachel, tell us about Latin America, if you can. Hmm. Well, you, you had, had talked with us a little bit about um, 
asking us if the exposure in, in the regions we work with is mostly to science fiction from the, from the US, and, and of course the, the answer is always yes and no. Um, you know, the genre is largely North-centric, but there is, there's local science fiction produced in Latin America from, uh, from the times that, uh, that some of the earlier panelists were talking about, from uh, the 19th century or even the 18th century, but there's not so much a, a local, sustained, national tradition. Um, the sort of thread that runs through and ties these works together are, uh, tend to be northern works. Uh, and so it, uh, there's not a, a local tradition or a sustained local tradition and community until the, the, the space age more that, I, that I'm working with later. Uh, the other thing that I, I should emphasize from the beginning is I'm talking about Latin America, but it, it is such a, a diverse region that you're really talking about uh, different traditions. Um, it, it brings up what, um, you know, Alex Rivera's work uh, uh, when you talk about Mexican science fiction and Mexican U.S. border is a uh, one particular um, aspect of it that has really, you know, its own issues involved. And in, in, in fact, my, my students at Iowa State are, are watching Sleep Dealer today when I'm uh, here at the University of <laughs> Iowa in a Latin American soup class. It, it fits quite well mm -hmm. uh, with, with some of these uh, uh, realities of, mm -hmm. of today and, um, and what's happening. But... Um, yeah, I, I'm really interested in, I'm, I'm also really interested to hear about um, what's happening in other regions of the world that I'm less familiar with, uh, science yeah. fiction traditions, because the issues of influence versus originality are always very central to some of these texts, especially maybe in Latin America, where Latin America is a part of the Western tradition, but um, Roberto Gonzalez Echevarria says, you know, Latin America is at some level always also inside, it's not outside, it's not the other, uh, it, it's part of uh, this Western tradition, uh, but at the same time you're writing from the periphery. Uh, mm -hmm. And one thing that I think that Latin American science fiction can really do is give us a different perspective on uh, where we are in, you know, in the center northern uh, axis that is often being looked at. And, and I'm just going to, I noted down a few examples of, of that, I, that I particularly like. And uh, one I say a lot to my students is, uh, you know, you get science fiction films. I always think of the poster for Independence Day with the big spaceship over the, over the White House and, and the aliens saying, take me to your leader. And, and it's, it's, it's never the president of Argentina or Bolivia <laughs> or Uruguay. Um, so, uh. Yeah. Well, thanks, Rachel. Uh, let me move to you, Nathan, uh, Nathaniel. Maybe you can tell us, uh, you know, give us a picture of what's happening in China. Yeah, I think, you know, you mentioned the idea that not many of us would think that Chinese science fiction actually existed. And that's a really um, fortunate misconception on my part because it means I have a career out of it. Um, it. It's also a very common misconception even in China. So I meet Chinese literature or cinema scholars and I, they say, what do you work on? And I say, Chinese science fiction. And they say, we have that? <laughs> um, so you, you, know, you shouldn't feel ashamed at all. You're not alone in any way. Um, it's also similar to what Rachel was mentioning where Chinese science fiction sort of comes in fits and starts. Um, and one of the, I think one of the really interesting things about that is that some of the most dystopian moments in China's history, science fiction has been its strongest. Um, when China was a semi-colonial uh, country at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and, and during the May 4th period uh, in the 1919 and through the 1920s, which was one of the most uh, utopian times in Chinese history and Chinese literary history, science fiction totally drops off. So this is really strange, right? And kind of ties in with that idea of why is, why is it so dystopian when we think mm -hmm. of the future? Mm -hmm. um, and this seems to happen in China too, I think for some similar reasons and some different reasons. Um, where was I? And, and so that, you know, interestingly in the, in the socialist period, once again, we have a little a blip of science fiction, but it drops off again. And socialism ought to be a utopian time when we're thinking about the future and about ways we can go. Uh, so yeah, it, it kind of comes and goes in strange ways. And there's been a real resurgence now uh, enabled by internet technology and fan fiction. And there are, um, you know, again, issues with how you define the genre. It's sort of interesting because it came up the idea that if, if we define science fiction based on the word science fiction, we can't say we have it until the 1930s. Mm -hmm. 
Well, even though it's imported into China, I could argue that China had it first because you have this word, which literally means science fiction, and it <laughs> appears as a genre in magazines next to works. Um, and, and so in this very odd sense, I could say we had it first, even though that's <laughs> referring to translations of Jules Verne. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, just in terms of um, publishing these works, were there times in Chinese history where, where it all had to sort of be done underground? Or? Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the publishing industry has its um, ups and downs, and uh, there were, you know, during the Cultural Revolution, almost nothing is published at all, uh, let alone science fiction. The other interesting thing you have, and I'm, I'm sure this goes on in other areas, I'm just much more familiar with China, is, and you know, it, it speaks again to what do we call science fiction. You have a lot of sort of sub-genres, so there's this other genre called the Koshue Xiaoping, which is kind of a science essay, and it's a, it's a story, and it's about science, but it's usually too mundane and not really fun enough to call it science fiction, <laughs> right? It's just sort of popular science writing. And you have a lot of children's writing as well, and, and these things all sort of trade off with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, just recently, the Chinese government uh, banned television shows about time travel. Really? Um, and, and the rhetoric behind this was that this was sort of dangerous to be so focused um, on things that weren't you know, concrete realities. Uh, but the rumor I've heard is actually that all of these shows were produced by uh, provincial television stations. And so the, the central government television stations weren't making enough money off of ad revenue. Mm -hmm. And that the ban really has more to do with, with wanting to get their hands on that ad revenue than it does on any sort of ideological mm -hmm. notion of whether or not time travel is uh, you know, spiritually polluting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had heard that um, there's Science fiction is quite popular among the youth in China now, but um, maybe not so many older people are are involved in an interest in science fiction. Is that true? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that's probably so, and I think we generally conceive of science mm -hmm. fiction as sort of a, a more youth-oriented mm -hmm. genre, right? Uh, I'm also, unfortunately, kind of disconnected from it, because like I said, I. I had really meant to study the entire 20th century, and I never got a whole lot past 1905. Um, so, you know, what I am aware of, it's, it's, um, it's often still thought of as a kid's genre, mm -hmm. and I'm usually the oldest person in that part of the bookstore <laughs> um, when I go look for, uh, you know, new stuff that I could yeah. do research on. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks. Well, uh, Sami, let's, let's turn to you. I know that you've been interested in science fiction really all your life, and you've been here in, in the States and at the University of Iowa for this last year. But um, give us a picture of science fiction in, in India and in Bollywood, if you will. Uh, well, the good thing is that <clears throat> since people even here can't really agree on a definition of science fiction, we Indian can you know, produce any sorts of movies and say this is science fiction. So, but, you know, if we really, you know, take the actual you know, concrete definition of science fiction and just take any one definition and say that, okay, this is the most accepted definition of science fiction, and now let's see which Bollywood movies fit in this particular definition. Then we do have lots of movies, well, it's not lots, it's, you know, just six or seven, but the, sl the difference is that in India, science fiction always incorporates a certain degree of spirituality. So if you talk about movies which have a certain degree of spirituality, which talk of dystopias and utopias, which talk of the past, you know, the arcade, the beginnings, then, you know, uh, we have had a tradition of science fiction. But the argument which is given is that we as a nation did not have a science fiction tradition till the British arrived. What we had was a speculative fiction tradition which was based more on mythology and fantasy, mm -hmm. which was the other strain of speculative fiction. But in the recent times with globalization, with the rise of middle class, fantasy and mythology movies are also being made by Bollywood. But what is also happening is a simultaneous rise in hardcore science fiction or as science fiction as the West knows it. So, and, and they are not just remakes of Hollywood. What they do is, there is uh, an extremely high degree and, and, and you know, a, a very clever sort of you know, appropriation where scripts may be taken, but science always complements religion in, in, in Bollywood science fiction movies. Bollywood, in, in those movies, science and religion never you know, fight. They always unite to 
portray a perspective which is distinctively Indian. Does that mean that they have more of a utopian nature rather than a dystopian nature? Uh, well, yes, that's true, but the, but the reason for that is because of the material realities that because of the current, you know, uh, scientific revolutions, we haven't yet felt the negative aspects of scientificity. Mm. We, we, we have, you know, you know, till now we are basking in the glory of the positive aspects. So till now the effects haven't, you know, hit us. So we are waiting for that. <laughs> and I hope that you know, that's delayed as much as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> huh. So there's one other thing I know about you. Um, even when you were interviewed to be a Fulbright scholar here at our university by Philip Letkendorf, one of our professors, you uh, told him apparently in, in quite um, excited terms that you would be pleased to come to the University of Iowa because it's so close to the future birthplace of Captain Kirk, Riverside, Iowa. Yeah. So tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. So when you know my friends, my, my, my Fulbright friends were happy, you know, and, and they were applying to Yale and, Yale and Princeton, and, and I was like, no, I'll be happy with Iowa. And they were like, why? Because Iowa is near Riverside. And they were like, what's Riverside? <laughs> <laughs> what's Riverside? And I said, and you know, because uh, science fiction isn't that popular a field back home, and but geeks and nerds do exist back home too. So, <laughs> so, so for me, that was the birthplace of James T. Kirk, and I'm a big, big, big fan of Star Trek, and I'm, you know, that was one of the reasons I came here. So, <laughs> I understand you're something yeah. of a regional celebrity when you go down to to the Riverside area. A yeah, lot of I, people, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, incidentally, uh, the family which runs the Voyage Home Museum there is my host family. <laughs> That's great. So I spend <laughs> lots of time there in the museum and, you know, activities about Jim Kirk and, you know, Star Trek. So I'm happy as hell. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Um, so let's let's go back to you, uh, Istvan and Sherilyn, and maybe you can share a, a little bit more about Japanese uh, science fiction. And obviously, it's a it's a big field, anime, and manga. We already learned that that some of the Japanese science fiction feeds very directly off of that or intertwines with it. Um, and Hungarian science fiction, I guess, is something you're familiar with. Am I correct? Well, let's start with Japanese. We'll start with <laughs> Japanese. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, as I, I was saying a little bit earlier. Japanese science fiction starts in the late 19th century, just about the time that it's really getting going in North America and Europe. Uh, the novels of Jules Verne were translated to Japanese just a couple of years after they were written, which is kind of amazing because Japan had just opened to the outside world in 1867 uh, after 200 years of complete isolation. But suddenly everything is flowing in, science, technology, knowledge of all kinds, and, and this is a good thing. Um, and the organs of state in Japan were working very hard not to be colonized, kind of looking at China and seeing how it was being eaten up by the other mm -hmm. nations of the world. So it was a very technophilic time in the sense that um, military might and what we did not then call technology but, but was, communications technology and that sort of thing, was seen as the way not to get um, colonized. And so um, Japan very early on takes in literature as a, as a technology, in a sense, of imagining how to, uh, how to uh, survive in, in this very complicated world in the late 19th century. And things like the cin cinematograph was imported to Japan like just a year after it was invented. All sorts of things were flowing in at that time. And so literature was also on that same bandwagon. Um, in the year 1900 is the first real science fiction novel in Japan, according to many people. It's called Undersea Warship, and it's kind of a response to Jules Verne's um, submarine in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And it's Japan's even better and bigger and more technologically exciting version of, of that uh, submarine. But it's also about how Japan is going to be one of the uh, advanced nations of the world it's not so much about imperialism yet, although Japan does march down an imperial road very soon thereafter, but it's just about how to, how to survive and be one of the big boys uh, in that sense. And a lot of early Japanese science fiction moves in that line. I already mentioned, though, that, that as early as the 12th century, you've got themes or ideas that are, are things that we associate with science fiction. So there's a lot of, of Japanese cultural materials being put together with the new technologies. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Istvan, who asked a, a brilliant question at a conference in um, Hong Kong 12 years ago. He, he asked, why are Japanese cyborgs always female? And 
I've been asking myself that question ever since. Um, there are a lot of things about Japanese science fiction that seem to be um, somewhat unusual. One of them being a real intense focus on questions of gender, sex, and sexuality. And through the figure of the cyborg that we were talking about earlier, there's all kinds of exciting ways to explore that kind of question, some of which do get explored and some of which don't because it's still, particularly when we're talking about animation or, or live action film in science fiction, Japan is still very much a, a male dominated world, the world of, of filmmaking. So in the things that, that come to North America, we don't always see those explorations of gender, sex, and sexuality, but there's tremendous feminist science fiction in Japan. It's, it's a really exciting place to study science fiction. <laughs> If, if I could kind of cut in really quickly here, I just I thought um, China really needs to acknowledge um, their debt to Japanese science fiction, actually, because a lot of what I was talking to comes in through Japan as kind of a a, a distorting window, if there's such a thing, or a distorting mirror. Um, Jules Verne, for example, is translated by Inoue Tsutomu, and then that comes to China in translation once again, and is sort of transformed to look more like a Chinese genre, but it's, it's always being filtered through Japan. Um, and Sammy also mentioned that there's this idea that uh, there are attempts to make um, local, you know, spiritual concepts and scientific concepts mash up. Yeah. Um, and there's a, a story I translated recently called New Tales of Mr. Braggadocio. And it's, a, it's actually a translation of a Japanese translation of the Baron von Munchausen stories, uh, Hora Sensei. Right? Um, and, and there's this idea in there that somehow Chinese Taoism can be expanded to accommodate science. I mean, it's, it's a really wild story. Um, but yeah, you definitely see, I think, parallels with India, and, and like I said, mm -hmm. we owe a lot to Japan in our field. So. Well, and I, I just wanted to comment on the, um, the spiritual dimension that, uh, actually, I'd sort of like to throw it to you, Rachel. I mean, the, the Christian, the, 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 the problematic of the relationship between Christianity and science and modernity seems to be one of the driving forces, at least historically, in Latin American science fiction too, right? So uh, a good materialist, empiricist, Anglo-Saxon might read the science fiction of all of these cultures and, and say, what's all this religion doing in here? Um, and yet probably the, the, if you took the production of the, of the world science fiction together, more of it would be actually wrestling with issues of religion and science than you would see normally in America. Isn't that right? Uh, yeah, and it, and, it, and it can depend on, on which moment you work with. When, in my work with early science fiction, I, I, I start out with, the, like in India, with the optimistic uh, moment of the late 19th century when, when science is going to solve everything. And so you get the, the science religion debate and tension uh, with, with one another. And then uh, you get to the early 20th century, and, and, and science hasn't solved all of our problems. Uh, and so then, then uh, that seesawing religion sort of moves more to the fore, uh, but also alternative sciences, alternative mm -hmm. religions, people making their own pastiches of, of solutions uh, as, as people do. Um, and I, I'd hate to generalize too much about it, but perhaps there is more uh, space for that in, in Latin America than some places. Um, I'd also say, also thinking about northern influences in Latin America, I, we, tend to talk north-south uh, in, in what I do. Um, when, when I say north, I mean um, not Spain and Portugal. Uh, it means you know, uh, Great Britain, especially France, uh, Germany, uh, occasionally Russia, uh, and uh, well, especially in early works, the, the United States is always in there. We're the engineers, the, the, the theoretical scientists are, are, are all European, and uh, as a rampant generalization. Uh, and then, um, uh, yeah, the, these, uh, it can be just a question of perspective, can mm -hmm. it? And, and just which um, things that, we, that we, we take so for granted here, when you look at it from another region of the world, it, 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 it sometimes turns things on their head yeah. or, or sometimes just give it a small twist. My, my, one of my favorite examples uh, in an article I was just working on is a, 
uh, sorry, I'm getting away from religion here, but it's a, a, a 1992 anthology called Sin Permiso de Colón, uh, which was done in, in Mexico. It's uh, without permission of Columbus, and it was done in, in honor, of, in honor it, <laughs> for the occasion of the, the 500th anniversary of the arrival of Columbus, and, and uh, some Mexican science fiction writers wanted to uh, be thoughtful around that uh, process, but this is, you know, obviously, um, Columbus doesn't turn out to be very heroic in, in many of these stories, though, though Hernán Cortés uh, turns out a lot worse, I have to say. Uh, but this gives you another perspective. The, the words discovery uh, are not used. Uh, you, invasion is, is used more often, or, or encounter, uh, and, and just more of a, a nuanced look at something that uh, we, we sometimes look at with a little bit of blinders when we, we get sort of focused on our own culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, can I make a small comment here? Uh, science and religion both, you know, explain life, or they explain, you know, things around us, and they want to be seen in isolation. But you know, fusing them isn't that hard as it may sound. Because, for example, I'll I'll take the, uh, there's this Bollywood uh, science fiction movie called Koi Mil Gaya, which talks about first contact between humans and extraterrestrials. So it has spaceships, it has aliens, it has all the semantic elements which are there in a science fiction movie, but the aliens are, are attracted towards the Earth because Earth scientists broadcast a Hindu phrase called Om, which is received by, which is received by the aliens and comprehended and decoded and understood, which is why they you know, come for first contact. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, fusing these two things isn't that hard, and there is a tension between, uh, you know, there's a, you know, lots of friction between these two entities since time immemorial, but there's a new sort of thinking which says that, that fusing them is the future. So mm -hmm. let's see how that works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anything you want to say about uh, Japanese science fiction, um, Istvan? Pardon me? Uh, Did you want to say anything further about well, not, Japanese Not so much about Japanese. Uh, you'd asked about Hungary. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I have to say that there isn't that much Hungarian science fiction. There is some, but it's actually um, um, an interesting case. Uh, I, I think that there's, there's science fiction produced and read any place where there's a, a middle class that feels, that, that actually does the art, uh, that feels um, technology impinging on the social life, on their everyday lives. So that covers any modernizing society, but that doesn't mean that all, all cultures, well maybe, uh, eventually it'll probably mean, because of globalization, all cultures. But it doesn't mean that all cultures are um, sort of going to become naturally inclined even when they, toward science fiction when they feel this kind of <laughs> pressure. And I have to, th to say that Hungary in that sense is an anomaly. It's, it's it produced some interesting works. There's, there are fan clubs. There's uh, American texts are followed avidly. But I can't say that there has been very much uh, creative and original work there. What makes that particularly unusual is because that part of the world actually has one of the strongest traditions of science fiction other than the Western European, or the historically rather, other than the Western European and the, and the North American. Um, in, the, in East Central Europe and Russia, uh, science fiction has been in existence um, and, and producing lots of uh, original and important works uh, really since the time of Jules Verne. Um, Russian science fiction is, is at least as important uh, for many Europeans as, um, as North American was. Uh, the, the most important heroic Russian um, uh, rocket scientist, uh, Tsiolkovsky, got his ideas um, for building uh, 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 rockets that eventually led to the Russian space program, Soviet space program. He got it from reading Verne. He himself wrote science fiction. Um, Russia has had a tradition of science fiction, utopian, dystopian uh, writing that's as rich as any uh, in any language, although there too, um, like in China, there's an enormous hiatus for very similar reasons. I think Stalin simply said you could, you could only write a certain kind of science fiction because if you wrote about utopias in the future, then it would be read as a critique of the present. Mm -hmm. um, 
writing dystopias was, was, was not permissible. Um, uh, and, and really, uh, Russian science fiction, Russian language science fiction sort of doesn't come to life again until Stalin's death. After mm -hmm. it comes to death, there's this enormous explosion of creative work. Um, the, some sci science fiction writers in Russia were the most read writers uh, uh, among contemporaries. Um, the Strugatsky brothers, the great, great writing team, were the first authors read in space. Um, I, I'm not sure whether the book was <laughs> smuggled up or not, but it, um, uh, so there, there is a tradition. Um, and then also there was an independent one uh, before the Soviet occupations in, in Poland and Czechoslovakia in particular, Chapek, the originator of the term robot, it was, a, was, uh, was a Czech, um, and that, that actually, that tradition continued even under Soviet occupation. Um, Polish science fiction is probably the, the flagship, the, high, the sort of the highest achievement in that zone, produced Stanislav Lem, who was, um, I think, generally acknowledged to be one of the greatest science fiction writers of the last century. Um, so uh, there is a, a sort of central East European tradition of science fiction that's deep, it's political satire mixed with utopian vision, mixed with sort of responses to, complex responses to sudden modernization in an area of the world was, which was one of the first peripheral, you know, yeah. what we would consider a peripheral zone that was drawn into the web of modernity. So why did the Hungarians, um, why were they not inclined to that? That's a, I, I don't, I have hypotheses, but um, uh, not, every, not every tradition is as, um, is as open to or mm -hmm. feels the requirement to, mm -hmm. to be science fictional. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I thought it was kind of interesting that we would be talking about Hungary and Japan yeah. simultaneously because Japan, exactly the opposite happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the impression is that science fiction is actually the, the normal cultural atmosphere mm -hmm. of contemporary Japan. Mm -hmm. um, in Hungary, it would be exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. Wow, this has been such an interesting program. I can't thank you all enough. I'm sorry to say our time has run out. Uh, Rachel Haywood Ferrer, thank you so much. Nathaniel Isaacson, Sami Khan, Istvan Cicerni Rone, and Sherilyn Orbach, thank you so much. Thanks Please for having thank us. Our guests. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the study. So we have come to the end of our program. Uh, thank you, all of you who've come here to be with us this evening. A special thanks to UI faculty members Jennifer Feely and Sarah Ann Wells, who are the co-directors of the UI conference Visions of the Future, Global Science Fiction Cinema. Uh, thanks to them, we were able to get these great guests here with us tonight. Uh, World Campus will be here in this room again on May 4th with the topic Art and Memory. I hope some of you can come. Uh, we want to say thank you to our partners, UI TV, UI Pentecost Museums, KRUI, and Information technology services. So I'm Joan Kerr. Thanks to my colleagues at uh, uh, International Programs, and we'll see you here, I hope, next time. Thanks for coming tonight. Bye-bye. <laughs>